Welcome to the Journey Church this morning. Uh, we're very happy to have you all in this room. Uh, whether you're a part of the body of Christ or not, we welcome you with open arms. Let's go ahead and prepare our hearts for worship this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you for another day you've given us, Lord. Lord, just be with us as we worship you this morning. Fill us up with the Holy Spirit and fill us up with your word this morning as we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Whether you're on your uh, couch or recliner, please stand as we worship this morning. From sad to rule and reign in our hearts again, increase in us we pray, unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very soul. Holy Spirit, come invade us now.
for the throne this morning to confess our sins. come before you this morning. Lord, forgive us of our sins and trespasses we've done against you. Lord, help us to uh, forgive others against us. Lord, help us to trust you with all of our heart, Lord. Help us to give our hearts to you, Lord. Help us to give all of our lives to you. And just be with us this morning as we continue to worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
give you my life. I give you thy trust. Take it all, take it all, 
my life in your hands my heart is yours my heart is yours take it all take it all my life in your hands heavenly father take our lives please take our hearts Take it all. Lord, thank you for everything you've given us. Thank you for everything. Lord, you know what's going on right now. COVID-19. Be with us. Chaos in this. Lord, be with us as we continue. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated back in your couch and Well, hey, Journey, good morning. We are so excited that you're here with us. So wherever you're at this morning, if you're uh, 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 streaming from your couch or your car or your bedroom, or wherever you are this morning, we just, we just want to say welcome. Uh, we are so thankful uh, that you're here with us at The Journey. We know uh, lots of people have been streaming uh, the service and maybe have never even visited The Journey, never uh, have a- actually been here for a service. Well, guess what? We've got something for you, and it's coming next Sunday, uh, the 24th. Uh, The journey is going to be starting back to our services here. We've been having worship, but we're going to have it together in two services. There will be one at 9 and one at 11 o'clock, and so if you've been on our Facebook page, we're going to be posting this week a place that you can... uh, Go and, and tell us, uh, hopefully, especially those that are longtime journeyers, which service you and your family will be coming to, just so we kind of get a count. Um, and so we're doing this for, for two reasons. One is to work with social distancing, uh, so we'll be sitting in family groups together for worship. Um, we're excited about that. Um, so uh, we just invite you to come either at 9 or 11 next Sunday, um, and in between services, we'll be cleaning the area and doing all the appropriate things we need to do, but we're just excited to get back together as a church. So that's coming up next Sunday. Uh, so so you do know uh, we will continue to stream the services, so uh, we uh, are not at all going to dictate what you feel is best for you. Uh, so if you're in a high-risk category uh, somewhere in there um, and we, we encourage you to stay home stream it uh, we're still going to have that available for you um, or if you're sick or ill or running a fever uh, please uh, protect yourself and, and, and everyone else just stay home uh, but for everybody else we're going to be meeting together so I'm excited about that so if you're new to the journey I would invite you to go to our webpage at thejourneyclean.com. There's a, a tab on there that says connect. And so if you just click on that connect tab, um, it'll take you just to uh, our little connect card. We invite you to fill that out. Uh, those come to my email. And so we'll respond to those, either myself or someone else in our leadership team will respond to that and just uh, give you some more information about the Journey Church and the ministries here. So we started last week a new series in the book of James right um so James is towards the end of your Bible and so we talked about how James is 
uh, the writer of this book, and it's James, the brother of Jesus, or half-brother of Jesus. Uh, so James the Just is what they call him. He was head of the church in Jerusalem. And James really didn't come on the scene strong till after Jesus had already resurrected and gone back into heaven, uh, because James, as far as we can tell, was not a follower until after that point. And so James um, writes, I think, one of the most practical books on faith in the Bible. And so he weighs the difference between faith and works, right? How do you tell the difference between what is true faith and what is and how works are our result or a picture of that faith? And so we're coming to a point today uh, in James uh, verse chapter 1, verse 19 through 25, where we're going to look at obedience. What does obedience really look at? So if you have your Bible this morning, Bible app, I would invite you to open to James chapter 1, uh, just beginning in verse 19, and we're going to read through 25 this morning. Would you follow me uh, as we read through this? Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of a man does not produce the righteousness that God requires. Therefore... Put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness an implanted word which is able to save your soul. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and then goes away. And at once he forgets what he, what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being not a hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So a couple of key things to look at. So there's an emphasis uh, on, on, in fact, all of the first part of James on, um, on danger of self deception right of deceiving ourselves how do we how do we deceive ourselves how do people deceive themselves today well i think there are two ways that we can deceive ourselves today the first one is i, I think people deceive themselves when they think they're saved when they're really not and in fact jesus talks about that in matthew there's a deception that people uh, have that believe they're saved when they're really not. And we'll talk about that a little bit later this morning. And the second one is, is true believers deceive themselves in the Christian walk. This is when people think they are more spiritual than they are, when they're not. When people think they have it all together, and they really don't. See, spiritual maturity comes from a proper relationship to God through His Word. The inspired, written Word of God. Now the question... And this question for us this morning in this section is, how do we respond to truth? When you hear something to be true, if something is true, how do you, how do you respond to that? How do you respond to the truth of God's Word? We had a conclusion last week that the deception that's being pulled over people's eyes is temptation, right? Is we are all tempted, enticed. In fact, we're talking about being lured into sin and those de desires that end up in death. So Jesus' answer is plain and emphatic. The strength of our life and everything we are, okay, is grafted into His Word. It's grafted into the Word of God. So here's our big idea this morning, church. Obedience is all about the how and the what. It's all about the how and the what. So, twofold question. How are you receiving the Word? How do you receive it? After, after you've read it, and, and those who have been in church or, or sat in a church service in the last year, you hear a message, you hear the word, you read the word, how are you receiving it? And the second question is, what are you doing with the word you've received? What are you doing with that? Because see, it has to go somewhere. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews that, that the Bible is living and active. Okay, so the Bible moves and goes somewhere. Um, consider the relationship between a herd of sheep and a shepherd, Right? Man, Jesus, in, I love one of my favorite parts of, of the Gospel of John is John chapter 10, where Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd. Well, what is the role of the sheep? To respond, right? What happens if the sheep don't respond to the shepherd? Man, you've got a problem, right? They're in danger. And so for us, we're like the sheep. 
When the shepherd calls, how are we being led? Are we being led to grassy pastures where we can eat our full and be, and be satisfied? Are we being led by something else? Or we've been led into danger. In 2015, there's a movie called Experimenter. By the way, actually, my family sat and watched it this week because I had not seen it. It's, it's not the most tantalizing movie, I'll tell you that. It's, it's a bizarre movie. It's called The Experimenter. And, and it covers the life of a psychologist, Stanley Milgram, known for his experiments that really kind of walk the ethical lines of things you really should or should not do. Uh, in fact, he was helping reveal human nature to commands of obedience. What, it, what is human nature? Specifically, why people obey authority figures, even against their own conscience. And so the subject of the experiment was led to believe that they were administering electric shocks to them, right? So you had, you had a learner in one room and a teacher in the other. And so he was supposedly, the teacher, thought he was administering electric shocks to the learner. Okay, but all the while, he wasn't. There was no shock going across. And every time the scientists behind him would, would say, okay, to the next question, they were doing these association questions, they had to match and remember them, and they would hit a buzzer, and if they got the wrong one, he would administer the next one, 250 volts, 300 volts, whatever that is, right? And you could see the teacher's face just get, get bent out of shape, and finally most of them would stop somewhere in there. They're like, he's in pain because they could hear this supposed recording of him in agony in the other room, right? And at the very end, they bring him out and say, hey, it was all a hoax, right? We're not really shocking these people. But what happened is, is in Milgram's exper experiment, there was a demonstration that no matter how in control we think we are, everybody wants to be led by something or someone. And so these people were being misled. They were being led to do things that, that, that they thought were horrible. And they even, they even equated it to like the concentration camps in Germany. Like, like times that people have been led to do really, really horrible things. So how do we know, first, what we're being led by? Well, first, if you're, if you're reading the Word of God, you know this is our guideline. This is what you're being led by. And there are three questions we must ask. How are we preparing for the Word? How are we remembering it once we've prepared? And then how do we obey that word? How do we move that forward? Okay, so the first one. How are you preparing for the word of God? What did you do this week to prepare for the message you're just now hearing? I mean, think about that. What do people do during the week to prepare to hear the word? So he says here, look at the beginning of the text. He calls them beloved brothers. Okay, so these are Jewish Christians. He said, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. So the goal of Christianity is what? Perfection. It's perfection. There are no shortcuts. And so he says, I, I love it, it's almost kind of like a, a, an opposite thing. So he says, be quick to hear, but slow to speak. Okay, so we need to be quick to hear. James called the word the engrafted word. Do you notice that? He says in verse 21, he says it's the engrafted word. This means the implanted word of God. So um, I think it's really reminiscent of Jesus' parable. Jesus describes four kinds of hearts or soils. You remember that one? So, so in that one, the hard heart, which did not understand or receive the word, therefore there's no fruit. You had the shallow heart, right, that, which was very emotional but didn't bear any fruit. You had the, the crowded heart, which lacked repentance and, and permitted sin to crowd out the Word of God. And then the very last thing you had was the fruitful heart, okay? The good soil and the fruitful heart, which received the Word gladly and allowed it to take root and produce fruit. See, the final test of your salvation and of my salvation, okay, is the fruit. The Word of God cannot work in our lives or receive anything, in our lives, right, if we're not listening to what he's telling us. Mark 4.24 and, and Luke 8.18, Jesus, uh, Jesus said this, our Lord warns the use of careful hearing. So we don't often approach God's word very well. I think most people approach God's word by talking, not listening. I'll, I'll be honest with you. 
I'm a horrible listener, okay? And I don't know, those people who know me probably know that's true. My family in the room's nodding their heads. I, I'm a bad listener. I hope I've gotten better over the years, and I've worked on it. I've tried to be better at it, but I typically want to come at something talking. That's, that's our human nature, right? Because we're fixers, we're solvers. We want to talk our way through it. Don't we often come to God's Word thinking, here's what I want it to say. It doesn't really say that, but I want it to say that. So we need a divine legislation in our life. And, and, and this happens in three ways. We need a legislation for the year. You need your ear to be legislated, right? What's legislation? So if, I, if I'm in Congress and I'm legislating a, a piece of, of, of law that, or something I want admitted into law, I'm trying to persuade someone to, to take this and put it into law. I'm trying to give all the reasons for it. We need a legislation for our ear from the Word of God. That's why he says, be swift to hear. The duty of every Christian is a readiness to listen with a pure, unadulterated ear and heart the desires to hear. See, I'm afraid our age will not go down in history as a hearing age, right? Our culture will not go in, down in history. Why is that? Well, Aldi Stevenson once opened an address to students at Princeton University with these words. He said, I understand I am here to speak and you are here to listen. Let's hope that we both finish at the same time. Because it doesn't usually happen that way. See, the truth is, a lot of church attenders get through listening to a message, or we get through a Bible study, or we get through hearing the Word of God. And it no sooner leaves the mouth, and, and the Word of God comes to our life, and it just goes out the other ear. See, part of it's due to the short attention span of our culture, right? Why is that? Because we're distracted all of us, we are so distracted. Another part of it is that we're largely lazy. We're just a lazy culture. They call this culture probably one of the most illiterate cultures in our Western society that there's ever been. Why? Well, first, people don't read, okay? Because we've got everything on audiobooks, and, and we're just used to listening. That's all we do. Yet another part of that is we constantly encourage on every hand to talk, Right? I remember, I'm going to pick on my son because I love him dearly, and God made him the way he is, okay? But I swear we thought that boy would never talk. Why? Because everybody talked for him. If he hesitated, what? Mom and dad are like, Troy wants this to eat. And my daughter would say, Troy feels this way, Mom and Dad. And finally we're like, man, we need the boy to talk. We don't know if he's ever going to learn to talk. And so finally what we do is when we come to a restaurant, instead of ordering for Troy, we kind of push her, Troy, tell him what you want. Tell him what you want, son. Right? And it's our own fault. Why? Because we come into life not really listening. We want our children to talk so quick. Right? We want them to talk. We want to say Mom and Dad and all those are good developmental things. But somewhere we've stopped listening. Charles Spurgeon said this. He says, he is not satisfied with the buds of hearing. He wants the fruits of our obedience until you truly can hear with that kind of hearing. See, I was visiting with my daughter the other day, and I asked her, how's it going with our new grandbaby, Evelyn? And uh, she said, it's going pretty good. And, and I said, well, how are you sleeping? Are you sleeping any better? She said, oh, no, Dad, I don't sleep. I said, really? Not even now? You know, and she said, no, because every time, even when Chris is watching Evelyn, if I hear her whimper or cry, what happens to mom? The radar goes up. She's up. She said, I'm awake. I wonder if we listen to the word of God that intently. If it's, if it's like that, that, that baby's cry of a mom who can hear it, and her radar goes up. Do we listen to God's word that way? We need a legislation for the tongue, he says. So he says, don't only, not only to be quick to hear, but he said also slow to speak. Okay, this isn't Texas slow to speak, right? I'm sure when I, I, and I did a horrible job at that. I'm sure when I leave Texas, people probably think I have a draw. I don't recognize that I have a draw. That's not what he's talking about here. He's not talking about slow of speak. He's being slowness to respond, the slowness to respond to something in a negative way. See, see, the worship service of those days often feature people interrupting the speaker. If you go to Haiti and preach or teach, oh my goodness, they will interrupt you right in the middle of the sermon. 
right? And they warn me of that. If somebody has something to say and they want to either debate something with you, they will stand up in the middle of the message. Now, we don't do that here. Please don't come back and do that, okay? But they do that there. They stand up and they want to, they want to, they want to interject. See, when the Word of God is being declared, we must be on our guard against the tendency to inwardly start raising objections. So how does this happen? Well, let's say this morning that I decided hey, we're going to give a message on the sin of gluttony, right? And I'm like, all right, how many of you are excited about this message this morning? Well, we may not say it, but inward we're like, "Uh uh-uh, pastor, don't go there. I love my food, and I love my mashed potatoes and steak. Don't don't go there and call that a sin. See, the thing is, a lot of times we don't outwardly say that, but inwardly, yeah. See, learning something new is difficult. Have you ever tried to learn a new language? I tried to do that when I went to Haiti, not very good at it, trying to learn French and Creole. See, I can take time and effort, but the practice, you can become fluent. And, and in fact, N.T. Wright notes that growing in Christianity is like learning a new language. And the first language we have to learn is to shut our mouth and listen. It's the first language we learn, right? If we're, we're not used to that. We need to shut our mouth and listen. When have you learned a new language? The best compliment you can receive is what? You sound like a native. You sound like you've always been there, right? I mean, what a compliment somebody could say about our, 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 our intentness on the Word of God. Man, they know that word because they're really intent on the Word of God. We need a legislation for our temper And this is the second part. Now, this is a little different and a little difficult maybe to understand. He says, slow to speak and slow to anger. What are people, or what are they becoming angry at? What they're reading, right? The Word of God. See, when the Word of God is accurately preached, we will often find that it hurts, right? It brings up scars. Is the sword not something that pierces? In fact, in Hebrews 4.12, it says it pierces bone and marrow to the heart of a person. See, we're not quick to hear and slow to speak, but we plug our ears. We don't want to hear what the Word has to say. Um, think about um, 2 Samuel 12, story of David, right? So David, if you know a little bit about the story, man after God's own heart, he uh, lusted after Bathsheba. He, he contrived to get her into his bed and also to have her husband killed at the front lines. And so Nathan, the prophet, comes to point his sin out to him. And he gives him an illustration about a ewe lamb, right, that had been stolen. And David was indignant. He was angry at first. He said, oh, well, who is that? Who's the one that would do such a thing? And then Nathan confessed to David. He said, that's you, bro. That's you. I mean, to understand that he had sinned. And in fact, think about Peter in the garden when Jesus was being arrested. What did he do? He drew the the sword from the soldier, the centurion. He He was going to, he wanted to kill this guy, but he ended up just cutting his ear off, thankfully. Okay? Because he was angry, he was indignant at the plan that God had. See, we get angry and indignant a lot of times with the Word of God. We just don't say it. And then there's a legislation for the life. Look at the second part of this. He says, therefore, in verse 21, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your soul. So the word translated, okay, ridding yourselves literally carries the idea of taking off a garment, okay? I decided not to display that for you this morning, but that's what it means, right? To literally lay yourself bare before the word of God, right? I don't know how you read the Word of God at home, okay? Hopefully you have clothes on. But it's laying yourself bare before the Word of God. He says literally literally taking away all uh, of that filth. God puts His law into our hearts, the Bible says in Ezekiel 36. And we must take the Word of God seriously in our life. So what happens when we don't? Well, then we're not going to live it first. I think we need to understand that to receive the Word of God isn't just hearing. And this is the second one. How are you remembering the Word? So it's not just about preparing right and hearing the Word. It's about receiving it. So we remember the Word constantly. 
We should remember it constantly. So the word is remembered when it leads to self-examination. When it leads us to examine ourselves, to examine our motives, to examine our own heart. What, what is the main purpose of having a mirror in your house, right? Some of you wish you had no mirrors in your house. But what's the purpose? So we can look at ourselves, right? See if we're presentable. You may notice Pastor Mark does not have a beard this morning, right? Except for that right there. Okay, I can't get rid of that. And so he shaved last night. Well, I looked in the mirror, and I was going to bed last night, and I feel this tickle on my ear. There's one long hair about that long that I didn't get. I'm going, man, that would be really awkward if I showed up with this one long hair sticking out the side of my ear. And so I go in there, and I look in the mirror intently and find it, and I shave it off. And so if you look at this text, he says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only. For if anyone here is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like the man who looks intently at his natural reflection in the mirror, right? And he says, but when he goes away, he forgets what he looks like. It's like in the, in the fairy tales, you know, the mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all, right? Well, what are they wanting? They're wanting a, a reflection, whether it's an accurate reflection or not right? They, they want to be told the truth. I mean, I, I love in the movie Shrek, Lord Farquaad, you know, uses the magic mirror that is supposed to reveal the truth, right? But he doesn't like the truth when he hears it, so he wants to change it. And then he says there are those that merely glance. See, I think that's where we get a problem. We just glance at it, right? They forget what they see. And they fail to do what it tells them. Most people are glancers at the word of God, right? We finish, we come down to uh, verse 22, and we say, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. Shut the book. They're like, oh, that's nice, Pastor. I like that. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> we just glance. No, you can't glance at the word of God. It does nothing in your life. See, the phrase looks intently can be used to refer to stooping down. It's much the way when my son was about three years old and he would experience like a, a caterpillar or a new bug, right, on, on the pavement. What, what, do, what do children do? Well, first thing, we'll put it in their mouth. But, you know, they go down and they look intently because they don't know what it is. They're experiencing it for the first time and they grab it and they play with it, right? That, that's what it means to look intently at the Word of God, like a three-year-old, and we're like, oh, wow, I never saw that before. Man, that's so awesome. See, the word, the word that is remembered is when it's practiced. We don't remember it till we practice it. It's not enough just to hear the word. We must, we must do what it says. Too many Christians are marked Mark their Bibles. You know, we'll underline that this morning. We mark our Bibles. We highlight them. But I, I would venture to say very few Christians are marked by the Bible. I would say very few of us, our lives are marked by the Bible. Let me say that again. Too many Christians mark their Bibles, but their Bibles never mark them. So we use the word as our mirror. Well, how do we do that? It's actually three ways. You go to the mirror and you get an accurate appraisal, <laughs> Right? I mean, you cannot, mirrors do not lie. I mean, we, we've kind of enjoyed a little bit watching some of our favorite morning news shows. Now that they don't have all the fancy hair and makeup people. And we're like, well, that's what you look like, <laughs> you know? Because, what? We don't always get an accurate picture when we're looking at what the world sees. When we look at what God sees, we get an accurate appraisal of how we really look. The second thing is you go to the mirror to see what needs to change. I need this long hair cut off my face. That needed to change. And the third thing is you go to the mirror to change it. You go to the mirror to change it. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9 contains one of the most important passages in Israel's history. And it relates to remembering God's word. Let me read this for us. Listen, Israel, the Lord your God. The Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. These words that I am giving you today are to be in your hearts. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And then just a couple of chapters later, when you get to chapter 8, <laughs> he says again, 
This is interesting. Man, Israel is much, gosh, I can relate. He says, oh, be careful, by the way, that you don't forget what I told you back there in chapter 6, okay? Failing to keep his command, the ordinances, the statutes I'm giving you today. When you eat and when you're full, when, when you're in your beautiful houses that you live in and your herds and your flocks are large and growing and you have silver and you have gold and you're multiplying and you're increasing, be careful that your heart doesn't become proud and that you forget what the Lord God has brought you through and what he has given you. And he goes on to say, he led you through the great and terrible wilderness, which is poisonous snakes and scorpions, a thirsty land where there was no water. He brought you water. I think one of the greater pictures we get when we look into the word of God is we remember where we've been, right? And where God has taken, and then we see where he's taken us. So we don't forget God's word. He says, let it lodge in your heart. That means to take up residence, Right? It'd be like if I came to your house today, and my bag's packed, and I'm like, hey, Marcus, I'm coming to live with you guys, man. I want to lodge with you, right? He'd be like, brother, I love you, but you're not lodging in my house. <laughs> okay? <laughs> you know, but that's what it means. We let the Word of God lodge in our hearts and lives. It needs to come live with us. See, the question is, how much do you value this book? How much do we value the Word of God? Do we value it more than we value our reality television shows? Do we value it more than the songs we downloaded on iTunes this week? Do we value it more than the stats that roll off our tongues of our favorite sports teams and writers and people we know? How much do we value it? If all we do is listen to the Word of God, we become deaf. We don't really, really hear it. I have a challenge for you this morning, and I want to confess to you as your pastor, I've not done a very good job of championing this among you, and so we're going to do something differently. Um, I want to challenge you to begin memorizing scripture. I'm just convinced one of the bigger problems that we don't intently look at the word of God is we don't know the word of God. You have to know it. You have to write it, have it written on your heart. And so we're going to begin memorizing Scripture. So each week in the sermon, I'm going to give you a Scripture to memorize, right? So you ready? Wherever you're at, grab, grab your pen or pencil. This week is James 1.22. And you may already know it, and that's great. But if you don't, that is, that is our memory verse for the week. So I would love when we gather next week, somebody come up and repeat that to me. Let's, let's learn this together. Let's be doers of the word, not hearers, deceiving ourselves. Short verse, really easy to learn. Let's learn that verse. Men ought to lead their families to memorize scripture. Do you know that? So I'm telling every man out there this morning, notice I didn't say women. Okay, I love our ladies, and they can do that too. But the Bible mandates that, that we love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up to her, for her. And it says that we are to bathe them in the word of God. So you need to be teaching your family scripture. If we don't open up God's word and see what it says, we're not living truly as believers. If you grew up in, with siblings, um, you can probably remember seeing one of them get in trouble sometime, yes? Okay, so what did, what did we learn from that? Did their example keep you from doing wrong? Well, if yours was like my house, my brother actually talk me into doing all the stuff first so he could see what not to do, right? And then so he'd say, hey, Mark, why don't you go try this out? And, and he would then, ah, that's not a good idea. I'm not going there, right? But, but we learn by example. That's, that's one of the main reasons we read Scripture is to learn how to obey it. And this is the third question. How are you obeying the Word of God? How are you obeying the Word of God? Um, Though every story is, is a redemption story, um, I was reading one this week that really struck me. It's about Chuck Colson in particular. Uh, he embodies Christ's redemption. Uh, he was imprisoned. Colson was jailed for his involvement in the Watergate scandal. Um, and he found Christ in prison, or Christ found him. <laughs> After he was uh, released, he started Prison Fellowship International Ministries. You may have heard of it. It's worldwide. And he began to share how in the midst of his greatest despair, he said, all my achievements meant nothing in God's economy. No, the real legacy of my life 
was my biggest failure, that I was an ex-convict. He said, my greatest humiliation, being sent to prison, was the beginning of God's greatest use of my life. He said, only when I lost everything, I thought made Chuck Colson a great guy, and I found the true self God intended me to be. That was when I truly found my greater purpose in life. And he says, it is not, okay, get this, it is not what we do that matters. Okay, now that almost seems like I'm contradicting what James is saying, but no, I want you to hear the rest of this. He says, but what a sovereign God chooses to do through us, God doesn't want our success. He wants us. He doesn't demand our achievement. He demands our obedience. So yes, God demands your obedience, but he doesn't want someone who just glances at it, okay, and, and, or even maybe half-heartedly tries to obey. And so this is where we come to this. We obey the word wholeheartedly. It's not a half-hearted attempt. Right? I can make an attempt to do lots of things. I can make an attempt to tell you I'm a great basketball player. I can go out on the court today, and guess what? I can shoot the basketball all day, and you're going to find out Pastor Mark is a horrible basketball player. I, I, I play at full speed, and I foul out every game. I play it like football, man. It's a full contact sport, and, and I don't play it well. Well, what would make Mark a really good basketball player, if that were even possible, right? Well, you know what? I would probably hire somebody to get lessons, somebody who's an expert, right? Oh, hello, inner expert. <laughs> you have the expert right here in your Christian life, right? I would begin investing in that, reading it intently, learning everything about it, about the jump shot, you know, how to, how to hold my hand and do all the things that I don't know how to do, how to use my legs properly, okay? So sometimes we can half-heartedly go at obedience, what he desires is your life, your whole heart, your whole life, wholeheartedly. So far in our response to the word, we've learned receiving it humbly, to remember the word constantly, and now we need to obey it wholeheartedly. Just as the person who has no interest in hearing the word of God is a horrible, deceived person. No Christian obeys perfectly. Okay, so let me put that out there. In fact, in 1 John 1, 8, it says, but every Christian has a desire to obey, Okay? Every Christian desires to obey, but, but if we say we haven't sinned, we may God out to be a liar. So there's no perfect person in this. James' words sound, words sound eerily familiar to Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven on that day. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we drive out demons in your name? Didn't we do many things in your name? See, that's the half-heartedness. That's not a wholehearted obedience to the word. Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. And then he goes on to say, he says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a sensible man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded on that house, yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. He says, but everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And so when the rain came and the rivers rose and the winds blew and pounded against that house, what happened? It fell and it collapsed. If your spiritual life is built on mere listening and you are not wholeheartedly, intently following his word, I'm, I'm going to say something to you this morning that may sound a little bit shocking to your ears. You may not be saved. You may not be saved because I believe the Spirit, if it's truly living your life, is going to give you a desire somewhere for the Word of God, not just to be a glancer. That somewhere in your life, now I'm not saying you're living it perfectly. And yes, I granted there's times sin comes in our life and, and we choose to ignore the word. But somewhere in our life, in fact, Bishop Brownrigg said, to deceive is bad, to deceive yourself is even worse. In fact, Charles Spurgeon, before every sermon, he would say this to himself. Think about this, Charles Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers uh, that lived of our time, he said, I'm frightenedly convinced that countless people within the church listen to the word week after week after week, and yet it is not planted in their hearts. And it is evident because they are not acting on it. Sure, they act on the things they agree with, that agree with their lifestyle, what they want to do, but they, they are not convinced 
They're not convicted. And he says, and in, in the front of all of that, and the challenge and the conviction is be careful. If this describes your life, you are not even a Christian. You're not even a believer. As a pastor, one of the phrases that concerns me the most is someone will say, I just need to be willing to be obedient to the Word of God. You know what? Every Christian should be willing to be obedient. If you're not, then maybe the, the problem is, is you're just a hearer. You're not a doer. See, don't be willing to obey the Word. Obey it. Don't be willing to help those in need. Help them. Don't be willing to share the gospel. Share it. Don't be willing to live in purity. Live it. See, we are to be doers of the word. It's like the traffic laws. When you leave here today, those that are in here and out there, and you go drive somewhere, what if you come up to a stoplight and you're like, I know that light says red, but I'm going to say it's green. I think it should be green, yeah? Or if you come up and it's green, and you're like, I think it needs to be red. Let me just stop today. That's horrible. It's going to be a train wreck. That's not good. What if a football team arbitrarily decides that it's going to take a, a first down as five yards? Or say a touchdown is 100 points. I mean, so we just change the rules. See, the freedom to play the game is adherence to the rules. And there's a cultural context. We have created a Christianity, I believe today, that stops at saying Jesus loves me. We stop there. We say he loves you just the way you are. And that's true. Partly, okay? I, I need to get to the point. Jesus loves you. Certainly. There's an amazing truth when it comes to Jesus saving love for you and, and his power over your sins. But I want you to hear this. But at the same time, Jesus says things like, you're my friend if you do what I command you to do. And if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. John tells us in 1 John 2, 4, the one who says, I've come to know him, yet doesn't keep his commands, is a liar. And the truth is not even in his life. So how do we understand all of this? Well, the word that is obeyed wholeheartedly never settles for listening. You will never settle in your life just for listening. So I want to say this with all the, all the love that I can muster this morning. Man, I know some of you have those, um, those little, I call them canned devotionals, and that sounds horrible, okay? They're not bad, and I've read them, okay? Or we have those little things we listen to. And those are good spiritual notes in our life. And those are good times to, to start off our day on the right foot. But I don't believe that's what James says when he says, look intently at the word. I think that's a glancing look in our life. Maybe we need to get deeper. Right now, there may be some of you out there who are in outright defiance and disobedience against the word of God. And you know it. See, that's the thing. It's the difference between being, being um, blinded by Satan, but it's another thing to deceive yourself. You know you're living in sin. You know what God's Word says, and guess what? You're just thumbing it in His face. You're saying, God, I don't care what you say. I'm going to do what I want to do anyway. See, the Word is saying care for how you hear this. Um, there was a book, Back to Jerusalem, by Chinese House Church. And I've probably shared this before. Um, it's written by Chinese pastors in a persecuted part of China. And it says that the Chinese officials in China, they really don't care if you read this book, honestly. They don't care if you, for the most part, even, even memorize this book. You know when they have a problem with you? It's when you start living it out. When you start doing the word. They said those are the ones that are imprisoned. Those are the ones that are persecuted. Why? Because they can tolerate Christians just existing with them because they don't pose a threat. Once you start to live it out. See, we stall so often at this point, and I, wanna, I want you to understand that, that to live this word, it, it means something completely different in your life. Um, so I, I want to close with Isaiah 55, 10 through 11. Listen to this. This is what the prophet Isaiah says. He says, For as the rain and the snow came down from heaven, and do not return there but water and earth, making it bring forth uh, sprout giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my words be that go out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish all that it is purposes, and it shall succeed in all 
that, that it was sent for. So you have rain and snow, part of the, the cycle, right, in our world. And, and as, as that comes, there are benefits, there's growth, there's crops, there's sustaining things, there's all this. And he says, his word to the rain and snow, because like the precipitation, God's word always fulfills its purpose. Just like the rain and snow, it always fulfills what it says it's going to do. So God's word will not return void. It is too powerful for that. So when God said, let there be light, what happened? Hello, there was light, Right? When Jesus said, peace be still to the waves and the winds, what happened? Take it to the bank. It happened every time. Why? Because there's power in his word. God's word will always prosper. God will succeed, and he will do all that he's purposed to do in your life to be an overcomer in this world. But you're going to have to get into the word. Let's be doers of the word, not just hearers. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful, God, that you've given us your word. Father, please forgive us for, for so many times, Father, that we've just, uh, we've taken that for granted. God, we just, we've become glancers. We've just uh, kind of passed your word in passing. And, and, and Father, I know there, there are all kinds of reasons and, and disabilities. Uh, we struggle with memorizing scripture. And, but God, I, I just pray that we'll take it to heart, Father, that uh, we'll begin to learn to look intently at your word. Father, as we know, it changes hearts and lives constantly from the inside out. Father, I pray this morning that you will change our lives, Father, because we are not just going to gaze at your word. We're not just going to hear it. But, Father, we're going to start living it out so that every part of our life, every aspect of, of our witness in this world, Father, will be saturated in the word, in the, in the beautiful word of God. That we can say we're not just mere listeners, that we're, we're not just mere gazers, that we are doers of your almighty word. We love you, Father, and we praise you. We pray all these things in your powerful name. Amen. Let's continue to worship this morning.
Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. We're so glad that you joined us here. Don't forget, next Sunday, um, we will be streaming, but we're also going to have two services, one at 9, one at 11. I invite you to come uh, join us if you're able here uh, next Sunday for worship together. Uh, also want to remind you, uh, God calls all who consider themselves believers and followers of Christ to give. Uh, and to be generous um, in their resources uh, towards the kingdom of God. And you can do that in a couple of ways here at The Journey. Uh, you can give online at thejourneycolleen.com. Uh, there's also uh, a, a, an app. You can go download our app and give uh, that way, or, or you can give uh, here at the church as well. And so we just invite you to do that, however God would lead you uh, to do that uh, this morning. So we're thankful you're here. Just remember our verse. James 1, 22. okay, have you forgotten it yet? Hopefully not, but be doers of the word, not only hearers, so deceiving yourself. So become a doer of the word here and out there as you live out the word of God this week. Let me pray for us as we go. Father God, we thank you, God, that you've given us life, God, that you've given us your word, and I pray that we would treasure it, that it become the most prized thing, prized possession we could have on this earth, Father. Because we know it's a direct link to you and to the kingdom of God. We love you, Father. We praise you in your amazing name we pray. Amen. Take care. God bless. Journey on.